don't know how many of you know this about Emily and I, but we, when we were dating and engaged, we were a long distance couple. We didn't live in the same town until we got back from our honeymoon and walked into the door in our new apartment together. We met in person. We met at a mutual friend's wedding. One of my best friends married one of her best friends. And we spent the whole weekend together kind of trying to help make this wedding happen. And I met her family that weekend and really liked them. And I was walking out the door and I realized, wait a minute, this girl is cute and I like her family and we worked really well together. Why am I walking out the door right now? But I walked out the door anyway. And... Uh, <laughs> And, and I changed into a, a white undershirt with stains on it and, and nasty old shorts because I was ready to drive back to Louisville. And I got in the car with my buddy Seth, and I took another breath, and I was like, what on earth am I doing? And I said, Seth, i got to go do something. And so I went back inside, and he said, you're going to go get that girl's number, aren't you? And I said, yeah, I am going to go get that girl's number. And so I walked back through this wedding party going on, everybody in their tuxedos and their fancy clothes, and I got coffee stains on my undershirt that I'm walking in there with, and just proud as anything, walk right up to her, and I walked out of there with a name, an email address, and a phone number, like, yeah, this is going to work, <laughs> woo! So, we got, so I got back to Louisville, and we started writing each other and talking a little bit, uh, and eventually that turned to talking on the phone, and eventually that turned to visiting each other once a month or so so that we could see each other and go out on a date. And finally, it got serious enough that we made a really big investment. We bought a webcam so that we could see each other when we were talking. This thing revolutionized, for me, our whole relationship. Because up till then, I would talk to her all the time, and I could only hear her voice, and that was fun. But I wanted to see her. And nowadays, I mean, we do this stuff with our phones all the time. We do FaceTime and whatnot. We take it for granted. But back then, it was like revolutionary technology that you could see somebody from far away that you were talking to. And so there I was talking with my girlfriend or my fiance, depending on when it was, and, and uh, I could see her face and I could see her react to what I was saying. And I, she could see me react to what she was saying. It was almost like I was there with her, except it wasn't at all like I was there with her, right? Nothing beats flesh and bone next to flesh and bone. And today, even, uh, we use our phones and our computers to FaceTime with Emily's parents and with my parents so that they can see our kids grow up. And it's awesome that even from far away, they can watch our kids grow up, even though the gospel has called us to a faraway land. And yet, on Tuesday, we're packing them all up in the van and we're driving down to Mississippi so that we can spend Christmas with them because... FaceTime is just not the same as being with somebody, right? Flesh and bone needs flesh and bone next to it. And there's no substitute for that. Well, if you've ever felt that way, if you have ever wanted to spend Christmas with people you love, or if maybe you are going somewhere to spend Christmas with people you love, or they are coming here, or you can't because of work and you hate that you can't because you want to spend it with someone that you love, and you understand that a phone call or a FaceTime conversation is not the same, if you feel that, then you get a little bit of why we need Christmas. We have a relationship with God, right? But that's not enough. Flesh and bone needs flesh and bone next to it. We need God with us here. And that is why the name Emmanuel is so important and so precious. So turn with me, if you would, to the book of Matthew, chapter 1. We're going to read Matthew 23, oh, sorry, Matthew 1:23, and only the second half of the verse. So Matthew 1:23, the second half of it. Many of you know that I like big passages of Scripture, but this one concept deserves multiple sermons. He says this, and they shall call his name. Emmanuel, which means God with us. God with us. Not like God is a master clockmaker who wound up a great clock and set it there on the desk and watched it go from afar. Not like that. God with us. Not 
God who solves your problems from afar, like the tech support person that you call on the phone when you can't get your furniture together, you can't get your computer work, and you call them on the phone and they give you the answer to your problem even though they're far away. Not like that. God with us, here with us. Matthew is telling us here that if you want to understand who Jesus is, the first thing you need to know is that he is God here with us. And Matthew does that by making it a frame for his portrait of Jesus. You can think of the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, as four different portraits of the same person, if you want to. They're all correct, they're all true, and they're all pictures of who he is and what he does and what he is like. And readers come to them asking, who is this Jesus? I want to know who he is. And you read and you get the answer. You got the stories and the miracles and his teachings and you have his crucifixion and his resurrection and you roll all that together and there's a picture of who Jesus is. But Matthew does something special. He puts a frame around that portrait. So you've got this whole picture in this book of who Jesus is and you've got a frame around it as well. I'll tell you what I mean. Here in the beginning of the book, Matthew starts off by saying that he is Emmanuel, God with us, right? And we don't necessarily have to flip there, but if you were to flip to the very end of Matthew, you know what the very last words are in the book of Matthew? They're words of Jesus. He gives them the great commission, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And behold, I am what? With you. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Last words in the book of Matthew. So at the beginning and at the end, you have a frame. Who is Jesus? The frame is He's God with us. And he writes it here in chapter 1 in such a way as to basically emphasize the words with us. He basically uses the Greek version of italics when he's writing it. So it would look like, we'll try to put it on the screens here, it would look like God with us if it were like real literal English like that. He's emphasizing that God is with us. So if you're wondering today, who is Jesus? If you came here today with curiosity, who is he? The first thing that you need to know is that he is God with us. But how is he with us? Because the funny thing is, in that passage I read a minute ago, when Jesus says, surely I'm with you always, even to the end of the age, a lot of you know what happens next, right? It's the most ironic thing in the world. He, he leaves. He says, surely I'm with you always, right, to the end of the age. And then he he rises up into the sky and he's gone. And so now we're left with, you know, we trust him. We trust his promise that he's with us to the end of the age. But right after he said he's with us, then he's gone. And so what, what does that look like? Like, how, do, how, do, how is he with us right now? How is he with you right now? Well, he's with us in two ways right now uh, that are great and awesome, but we'll find in a little bit that neither of them are ultimately satisfying. And soon he will be with us in a very different and much better way. So first I'll walk through the two ways he's with us now. First, if you trust in Jesus, if you're a believer who follows him, you're one of his disciples, the Bible promises that the spirit of God dwells within you. Like God lives in your body. That's the spirit of Christ Jesus himself. He says, I'll send my spirit to comfort you and come alongside you. And so you have Jesus in you living in your body for the rest of your life and can never be alone. Your body is a hallowed and sacred temple where God reveals his glorious presence inside of you. So no matter how lonely you might be or lonely you might feel, there he is with you. He didn't do that before Emmanuel, before God with us. In the Old Testament, the Spirit of God would rest upon some people, very select few, for a little bit to empower them to do something and then would leave. But because you trust him now and follow Jesus, because Jesus chose to come to earth to be with us, you have Jesus dwelling within you and your body is a temple for his very presence. Now, that's awesome, but there's actually more than that. We are actually experiencing God's presence, the presence of Jesus Christ himself, the good shepherd, in this room right now in a way that we won't experience him three hours from now when we're either riding home or when we are home. We're experiencing him right now here in this room in a way that wasn't true even in this room a few hours ago because Jesus says later on in this gospel, wherever two or more are gathered in my name, 
surely I am with you, right? Not within you, not dwelling inside of you. He says, I'm, I'm with you. And so Jesus isn't just dwelling within you, Christian. He is sitting in the empty seat next to you because we have gathered in his name. And he is here right now with his hallowed and holy presence. That's the only reason we have these wreaths up on the stage. And that's the only reason we've got lights there and that we have guitars and drums and we have instruments and play and sing and we have more lights coming up from the bottom and there's Christmas trees and Christmas lights and all. That's the only reason we do all of that. All of that is worthwhile because when the king comes to town, right, you roll out the red carpet. We decorate this room in our house, not all of the other rooms, because this is where Jesus dwells, because this is where the people of God gather in his name. So all of this stuff we do, especially around Christmas time. It's just a big red carpet. It's just a welcoming for the presence of Jesus because he is here with us. Did you know that it is proper etiquette to invite the president to your wedding? I read it in Miss Manners. It's true. Actually, Emily read it in Miss Manners, and she told me when we were engaged. And she said that the way it works is whoever is like the highest official in your land, which for us is the president, or it could be the king somewhere else or whatever, you're supposed to let them know that you're getting married, and, and so you invite them. You send them the same invitation you send everybody else. And what they will do is they will send you a signed letter back expressing regrets that they can't make it to the wedding and giving you their best well wishes on their wedding. And so she told me that when we were engaged, and I said, really? She said, yeah, let's try it. I said, okay, so President Obama was president at the time, and so we sent 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, Mr. Barack and Michelle Obama, we sent that invitation right there, and it was like two weeks later in the mail, it worked. Emily Post was right. We got a letter in the mail from President Obama and Michelle Obama. This is someone else's letter, not ours. Ours is in a box somewhere, I have no idea where it is with his real sign, like pen and ink signature and Michelle's signature right on it, saying, we, we regret that we can't make it to your wedding, but every well wish to your marriage. That's a fun thing to do. If you're engaged or know someone that's engaged, tell them about that, because it, it works. You can really do it. But I think all of us know that the president's not coming to your wedding, right? We sent that knowing the president's not going to, we're, we're not the Secretary of State, we're not Chelsea Clinton, the president's probably not going to have time to come to our wedding, right? Well, Jesus works differently. Jesus says, if my people throw me a party, I'm coming. He says, I don't care where it is, I don't care when it is, if two or more of my people gather in my name, I'll show up. I don't care if there are 200 parties going on at the same time for me, I'm going to show up to every single one of them. So right now he's here, and he's down the road at Union Baptist, and he's down the road at Central Baptist, and he'll be across the road at Crossroads soon. He is where his people gather in his name. He comes to all of his parties. That means he's here with us right now. And that means that you, right now, are in the presence of either your Savior and God or of your greatest enemy, one or the other. Some of you, I hope, will comfort and rest in that right now because in all of your trials and in all of your struggles and whatever you might be going through that maybe no one else in this room knows about, we can sing a song like, I want Jesus to walk with me all along my pilgrim journey, and we know that he's here and he's with us. You came into the arms of the good shepherd this morning, and many of you, I hope, will take comfort in that. But when a group like this gathers... You always have, of course, a large number of people that are here because they worship Jesus Christ and they want to worship him. And then there's usually a smaller number of people who are here because they're curious about, well, who is this Jesus? I want to know more about him. Or, or maybe they have some other reason for coming. But then there's a small, I hope very, very small group that will come to a worship service like this pretending to be Christians, but hiding their true lifestyle. Right. deceiving everyone around them to make them think that they are walking in the light, but no one here knows that they are truly walking in the darkness. And my worry for anyone here who might be in that situation is that you walked in probably with a false sense of security. You walked in thinking, 
No one here knows what I do behind the scenes. No one here knows what I look at when I'm alone or how I talk to my wife or what I do with that other woman. No one here knows that, so I'm safe here. Nobody knows that, right? Except you didn't realize that the one who sees through it all is here. And he casts his eyes upon you. And the real worry that I have is that if this message rings through and you hear the footsteps of God here, you'll do the same thing that Adam did in the garden, right? He heard the footsteps of God, he knew that he was exposed, and he ran and hid. And I fear that for you as well. We've seen it happen so many times. People will fall into a life of sin and they'll hang on to their church attendance for a little while, and eventually they just can't bear being in the presence of God, and so they fall away from church as well. But I plead with you, Don't do that. It is not too late to forsake the darkness, expose your sin, and walk in the light. How often sinners hear his footsteps and run the other direction, but if they would only listen to what he's saying, he's saying, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He's saying, come and follow me, and his arms are open wide to receive all sorts of sinners, even hypocrites, into his arms. So it is not too late. Instead, shed your sin and come to him and follow him. So that's what it means that God is with us now. He dwells in every Christian, and he is in this room right now because we have gathered in his name. But would you believe me if I told you that neither of those are ultimately satisfying to me or to any of us? If we spend all eternity living life just like this and coming into his presence once a week like this and with him dwelling in us, that would not ultimately satisfy you. Does that sound Strange? Well, it has to be true because Jesus had promised more. There's more coming that will satisfy our hearts. And what he promises is that Jesus is coming back, not in spirit, but in the flesh. That the trumpet will sound, all of the dead will rise to meet him in the air, and he will come down just like we saw him go up. He will dwell with us here on earth in the body forever. And not in some like angel wing, halo cloud singing scenario that we might imagine. Like here on earth, on a fully perfectly restored earth, in his glorified body with our restored and glorified bodies, living with him. And he'll have kneecaps and he will have elbows and he will have hair. And he will have a voice that you will hear and recognize the way that you know your dad's voice from your brother's voice. You'll know his voice when you hear it. He will be real. When he first came... He was a real baby, filling up diapers with the rest of them, a real baby. And when he comes back, he will be fully glorified and fully perfected, but he will still be real. And Revelation says, behold, the dwelling place of God is now with man. If I could just say a word then to the, to the widows in our congregation, I know there are several of you, and one of my favorite parts of my job is that I get to visit widows from time to time. And the first time I ever visit a widow, I I try to make it a habit to ask them the same two questions every time because I want to know what that phase of life is like. And so I ask first, what's what's the biggest joy of this phase of life for you? And I'm pretty sure every one of them has said the same thing. My grandkids, like they just jump on it, my grandkids. And then we get into, of course, like this hour-long conversation and they have their phone out showing me pictures of the grandkids. And this one just graduated and this one did this. And so then I know everything about all 15 of their grandkids and it's great. And then I'll ask okay, what's the, what's the hardest thing about this phase of life? And all but one of them has said the exact same thing. It's really lonely. Not my body hurts. That's what I expected. Actually, that's what Thelma told me. She was the only one that didn't say that. She said, it's hard to get around anymore. Uh, not social security isn't enough. No, nothing like that. It's, it's really lonely. And so my mind every time goes back to Emily's grandmother died when I think she was 92, maybe 93. Uh, Her husband died, I think, when she was in her 50s. She spent roughly then 40 years without a husband. And when we were getting married, she pulled Emily aside at one point, and she said, she said, take good care of him so that he lives a long time, because this is really hard. 
Those are some of the last things she ever said to us. And I wonder if there are widows here in this room who hear everything I've had to say, that Jesus' presence dwells within you and that his presence is here right now. And I wonder if that's not enough for you because you don't just want the presence of the Spirit of God. You want to hear footsteps in your house again. And you want your laundry to be mixed with somebody else's laundry again. You want a real person in the body and the flesh with you. And I want to tell you that it's okay that none of that is enough for you. Because Jesus has a better promise coming to us. He, he loaned your husband to you for some time. And he took him home. But, but our husband, our Christ, is coming back. And it's not just in the spirit, but in the body. And he will have real hair and a real voice and he'll really be here with us. And you will wrap your arms around him and you will feel flesh and bone embracing you when he comes back for us. So there is good news to wait for. And you may not be satisfied now, and it's okay that you're not satisfied now. But I promise you this, when he comes back for us, you will be satisfied. And you will see that all the love you ever had for your husband was pointing to someone better who is coming for you. That's what Emmanuel means. God is with us. The dwelling place of God is now with man. You know, my son Josiah is going through a really fun phase right now where his imagination it's just running wild. It's just going crazy. And he thinks of all kinds of fun stuff, and he builds all these fun things together and invents all these stories, and, man, it's awesome. It's great until about 7.30 at night when he's been in bed for a half an hour, and that imagination just does not shut off. And so he gets up and comes out of bed, and he's, like, rubbing his eyes, and he says, he says, Dad, I'm scared. And I say, well, what are you scared of? And that's when we learned that somehow the world is like full of all these special monsters that have a teleport like right to underneath his bed and they can somehow just magically get there. And he says, I'm, I'm scared there's a monster under my bed. And uh, so when I first thought about that, I mean, I know every kid goes through this phase. And uh, I decided as a dad, I made a really bad decision, that I was not going to handle this the way that most dads handle this. Like, I was not going to get out the flashlight and be like, nope, no monsters under here. Like, I wasn't going to do that. So, like, the second or third time he came out, he says, Dad, I'm scared. And I said, what are you scared of? And he says, I'm scared there's a monster in my bed. And I looked at him and I said, you caught it, right? And he said, huh? I said, yeah, buddy. You know the only reason they're hiding under their beds is because they're afraid of you, Right? Oh, I said, yeah, man. I said, let me tell you something, buddy. When your dad was a little boy, your dad put a hurting on some monsters. And I told him this whole story about there's a monster under my bed, and I jumped in there to get it, but it got away, and I chased it down the hall, and I grabbed it by the ankles and pinned it down. I said, don't you ever mess with me or my family. I mean, I told him this whole thing, and I was sure that he was never going to be afraid of monsters again after this. Side note to dads, don't try this. It does not work. It is not a good idea. And so he comes out again the next night, didn't work at all. What are you scared of, buddy? I'm, scared. I'm still scared there's a monster under my bed. I tried the same thing. It didn't work again the next time. And so eventually, I just ran out of ideas. Like, I don't know what to tell you, buddy. Like, I, I, just go to sleep and you'll be okay. I didn't know what to say to him. And so he came out and he said, I'm scared. I'm scared there's a monster in my bed. And I was sitting on the couch. I said, come here, buddy. And he just curled up into my arms and just gave me one of the best snuggles in the world. And he laid his head on my chest right here. And I'm sure he could hear my heartbeat. And I could just feel him right there. And I was like, well, I don't really know what to do now, so we'll just hang out for a minute. And about two minutes later, he got up and whoop, walked back into his bed and went right to sleep. So I didn't even tell him anything. He, he didn't need a story. He didn't need me to tell him stuff. He didn't need any of that. He just needed me to be with him and hold him for a little bit. And when he had that, he could go face anything. Two or three nights of that, the phase was over. Little boy could sleep through anything all of a sudden. A lot of you are looking for answers to your questions or solutions to your problems. And what you actually need is neither of those. You just need God to be with you. The same way that a little boy just needs his dad to pick him up and be with him. So let's resolve then that we will look to Jesus together because he came down and chose to dwell with us and be with us. And that is what we need.
Hey guys, thanks so much for watching the sermon video today. If you found it helpful, would you consider sharing it with a family member or a friend? That would help us to spread this ministry and get the gospel to the ends of the earth. You can also find more information on our website, barryefields.com. Again, thanks for watching.